Welcome back to Showtime at the Senate. I'm your host today. My name is Nick Baldwin. I am a movie committee member of the Senate Theater. And uh, just to go over again, kind of what we're doing here um, is I want to give you guys a preview of everything we have going on at the Senate Theater in 2020 and beyond and uh, basically preview each show we have going on. So last week we did our first show, which was for Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. And uh, our show following that is Fatty Arbuckle and Friends, which is a uh, silent film series, which is um, a, a compilation of shorts featuring silent film star Fatty Arbuckle, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. I want to make sure I say Roscoe because I know that he didn't like the name Fatty. So, Roscoe, a.k.a. Fatty Arbuckle, and uh, the series is called Fatty Arbuckle and Friends. It'll be a compilation of six shorts uh, over the course of the evening on January 18th, Saturday at 8 p.m. My guest today is John Shetler, who uh, is also a movie committee member with me at the Senate Theater, and uh, ever since we first met, he has been wanting to show Fatty Arbuckle films. It's it's one of his passions. It's one of his uh, more favorite, more prized things that he is interested in. And um, so I wanted to bring him in today and uh, talk to you guys about Fatty Arbuckle and the Fatty Arbuckle and Friends series that we're having at Senate Theater. Say hi, John. Hey, Nick. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. So, um, Silence at the Senate is, our, is a series we have... Um, to tell you a little, guys a little bit about what we have at the theater, we have a um, the Fisher Theater's original Wurlitzer pipe organ, which um, if you were to have gone into a silent movie in the 1920s, 10s, 30s, all those decades, you would have gone to the movies and you would have seen a film accompanied by a theater organ. And after the silent films ended and talkies became a thing, the Fisher Theater essentially got rid of their uh, Wurlitzer pipe organ and upgraded to to talkie films. Um, as an organ club, so the Detroit Theater Organ Society is the organization that owns the Senate Theater and runs the Senate Theater, for which we're both members. And the whole point of that is to to handle this organ and to maintain this organ and to show off this beautiful organ that was originally in the Fisher Theater when you would have gone to see silent films at the Fisher Theater back in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s in Detroit, Michigan. Um, in the 1960s, the Detroit Theater Organ Club was formed, now the Detroit Theater Organ Society, and um, this Wurlitzer pipe organ is one of the largest in the world. I believe it's the eighth largest theater organ in the world and it's really treasured and uh we've maintained it since the 60s when we first bought the organ housed it in the senate theater and uh, the club has been having organ concerts ever since then and maintain maintaining the the organ and the theater since then oh, a few years ago do you know how many years ago exactly when we started silent films uh, probably about five years ago five years ago yeah. okay we we are both about a year two years in mm -hmm. to our turned that into the theater but um they started showing silent films as you would have seen us again as, as you would have seen a silent film back in the 10s 20s and 30s so this year we have our series silence at the senate we've coined the phrase uh we received a grant from the knight foundation and uh, culture source to fund our silent film series to keep this art alive and our first of the year is fatty arbuckle and friends so john was very interested in showing fatty arbuckle films and uh so, John, when did you first discover Fatty Arbuckle? What was that experience for you? Oh, <clears throat> as a kid, for sure. I, um, the I remembered, I don't remember how I heard of Fatty Arbuckle or Roscoe Arbuckle, um, but uh, Sorry, Roscoe. Yes, Roscoe Arbuckle. Um, I uh, I remembered uh, just as a kid. You know, that was the VHS era. Um, going to Blockbuster Video had had one one rack of silent movies, you know, very limited. Probably no one rented them but me. <laughs> and uh, I honestly don't recall uh, why I 
went there initially, I think I had heard of Charlie Chaplin and they had some Chaplin movies there, rented those and basically depleted that shelf of all the silent movies that were there and uh, started seeking them out elsewhere. And uh, Macomb County Library, the, the college library, had Keystone comedies on VHS and they were all from like 1915 and I, uh, I just rented them all and they were mostly Fatty Arbuckle. Um, and uh, so that's where I first experienced uh, his movies before I'd even heard of basically his story. And uh, so that followed up with checking out a book in the library about him. as a book from the 70s called The Day the Laughter Stopped, which, uh, I mean, today is known as, uh, you know, there's some errors in it, but it, at that time it was... You know, this would have been early 90s, I think. Um, for me, that was the only access I had to read about him at all. Right. Um, found it fascinating. And just from there, you know, I sought it out whenever I could. And now, um, you know, with streaming and all the other resources we have online, you know, you can, you can access more information and more films. Um, but, uh, you know, see him in the theater is really, you know, that I've never done. So, pretty excited for that. That's going to be awesome. And so, on January 18th at 8 p.m., tickets are $10, by the way, um, we're going to have uh, organist Andrew Rogers playing Mm -hmm. the organ, and he will accompany live every silent film uh, of the day. There are six shorts in total. Mm -hmm. Um, And we call the series Fatty Arbuckle and Friends, or we call the show Fatty Arbuckle and Friends because... Fatty Arbuckle really was one of the first silent film stars and one of the first comedians, um, one of the first groundbreaking film t- stars, really. And uh, all his friends in these shows are people who would blow up later on, like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. So you'll see a bunch of different um, silent film stars in there, both of those included. Um So tell us, John actually put together the program tonight, or for January 18th. Tell us about the program you put together, why you chose those types of films it specifically as opposed to other ones. Sure. Um, so we've teamed up with uh, Cinema Museum, uh, which is uh, specifically uh, my contact, uh, Paul Garucki, uh, who I've known for 25 years. And uh, he is a film archivist and um, uh, producer. Uh, he's released Blu-rays and DVD sets of, of uh, rare material. Um, and uh, so basically he, he also released a DVD set of Fatty Arbuckle Films, a box set. And um, he was gracious enough basically to let us use copies from his collection. So which didn't leave me wanting for content because he had so many things to choose from. And um, <clears throat> so I, I chose these films. And these are all provided to us by Cine Museum. And uh, I wanted to pick a, an array of shorts that kind of took you through the progression of Fatty Arbuckle and his career. So we've got, uh, we start off with a, a short from 1913. They call it a split reel five minute movie. Um, just pure slapstick, uh, you know, outlandish. And, and, and all of them have slapstick in them. But as you go on, uh, we're showing them chronologically. As you get to the, the shorts from, say, 1916, one called Fatty and Mabel Adrift, it's now a 30 minute short. It's got a story arc, um, it's got heart and a little bit of character development. Um, and uh, also has a, a house that gets pushed out into the ocean and, <laughs> and a big rescue at the end, so it still has all that craziness. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the gags get more sophisticated as you go on, and, and um, you can really see how he progressed as a, as a director as well as a performer. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I learned in my research on Fatty Arbuckle that he's one of the first artists, film artists, who directed his own work which i thought was very interesting yeah yeah that's true um that uh he, his uh first several years or i should say his first several years of, of active um performing in films were at keystone studios max senate keystone cops that's what they're known for mm-hmm. these days and um 
yeah, and he was basically given uh, the opportunity to direct a lot of the things he appeared in. And um, that kind of comes basically how he came in contact with, say, Charlie Chaplin, who in 1914 started out uh, at Senate his first year in films. And that was actually where he developed the little tramp character. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, his second movie is basically the first appearance of that character. Um, he had come from uh, uh, British Music Hall troops and um, was a comedic actor till then, but he didn't have that character until he started in films. And um, there's always, there's a, it might be apocryphal, I don't actually know. We'll find out on the night of the show because I'll <laughs> ask Paul, uh, because he has a lot of history on, on Roscoe Arbuckle, but uh, that... Uh, uh, when Charlie Chaplin was developing his character, building his costume, uh, he used a pair of Arbuckle's pants because they were, you know... Too big. Yeah, 60, 70 inches. <laughs> um, but that's the, that's the Hollywood legend. Um, but anyway, yeah, so he worked with Chaplin, um, and uh, he was one of the first out of the gate, like you say, to direct himself in comedy and offered uh, a certain amount of mentorship there to guys like Chaplin. Later on in, in the late teens, um, he brought Buster Keaton to the to the movies. Um, so he he discovered Keaton, brought him on to his series of shorts. By this time, Arbuckle was at Paramount, and he did a series of two two real shorts there, twenty minute shorts, and uh, Keaton was his co star. Mm -hmm. So for about a dozen films or so, and um, that's where you can really see. Uh, that's where Keaton learned how to make films, basically, because Arbuckle was directing himself, and he was very giving on, you know, the mechanics of filmmaking. In addition to, you know, working out bits of business in front of the camera. Um, so, yeah, that that's uh, that's his connection to the two, you know, giants that mm -hmm. progressed on after uh, after they worked with Arbuckle. Absolutely. And so to go from there, so he started at Keystone. Mm -hmm became a big star and was signed by Paramount then and um, started making short films for Paramount and short films at the time were well I guess short films are prevalent now but at the time they were more prevalent as far as on screen people would go to see a series of short films in, in the silent film era mm -hmm. and uh, so he was signed by Paramount and was such a huge success that he was uh, apparently the highest paid movie actor at one time uh, in the 1920s. In, I think 1920, he was the highest paid movie actor in the world. And um, was so sought after that uh, at Paramount, he, he shot three films at the same time and six films in seven months. Mm -hmm. and, and just to monetize this, the Paramount couldn't let this go. Um, as a result of this, he obviously required a vacation. He went to San <laughs> yeah. Francisco for this vacation where the most notorious angle of the Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle story goes. He has the party in San Francisco in the hotel room. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, just like you said, uh, it was like Labor Day weekend, 1921. Uh, break in filming. Goes up to San Francisco with a few friends. They rent three hotel rooms conjoining... Uh, hotel rooms at the St. Francis, which is still there, and uh, the uh, they have this big party, and you know the uh, people they knew came up, joined the party, uh, maybe some people they didn't know, and um, you know uh, bootleg liquor was was uh, available, and uh, unfortunately, an actress named Virginia Rapp uh, got sick at the party, and a few days later died, and. Um, Roscoe was charged with her her death, basically. Um, he, murder. Murder, yeah. Um, and uh, the original belief by prosecutors was that you know he had uh, committed rape, and and then he they lowered that lowered the charge down to manslaughter. Um, but in all actuality, there really isn't any evidence to support that that happened. Um, she had uh, some health problems and shouldn't have been drinking and she had, had a ruptured bladder because mm -hmm. of this and there's so many nuances to that case there's books written on just the case right. um, and uh, obviously you know we want to focus on his artistry but the reason that he's not as well known today part of that reason is because of um, the uh, lore that's been developed over this right. situation and he never 
frankly, overcame it. I mean, he was in trial three times, right? Two mm -hmm. hung juries. Yep. And then finally acquitted with a, a letter from the jury saying, we're so sorry that this has happened to you, essentially. Yeah. There is no proof that you've murdered this woman or did anything to hurt this woman. That's right. And um, it basically all started with um, essentially a whistleblower, right? Like uh, this, uh, I don't remember the name, the woman's name, but her mm -hmm. yeah. quote-unquote friend. Yep, Ma Delmont. The, Ma Delmont. Yeah. She, um, <laughs> who had a huge criminal rap sheet as a, basically a professional extortionist, found this opportunity to put her name in the newspaper and threw blame on, on Roscoe. And uh, from there, at this time especially, everyone found this as a moment to monetize the story yeah. uh, that Roscoe had murdered this up-and-coming starlet. Mm -hmm. um, the newspapers ran with it. They were making a lot of money from these stories. Um, the, the DA who was prosecuting him had political ambition, who mm -hmm. was trying to, you know, he was trying to get higher and higher in his world and wanted to get this murder prosecution to stick. And unfortunately, a, a, even after he was acquitted, so he, he's acquitted after the third trial. He's given an apology by the jury. And um, he's, okay, it's time to get back to the movies. What, how, how long does this take exactly, all of these trials? Um, the trials uh, started late 1921, not long after the incident. And uh, I, I just looked this up. It was by the summer of the following year. The third trial was over. Okay. Yeah, spring or summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Not long. <laughs> year, well, but years, right? Yeah. Well, nine, eight, nine months at least. Oh, eight, nine months. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so he gets out. Uh, he gets out from under this, and it's time to get back into movie making, to becoming, to going back to being the literally the biggest star in the world. And the time period from which this is happening. Is completely is an extremely conservative time period. Prohibition starts in 1920, and movies are under the gun. Frankly, the content in movies, which you know, if we were to look at them today, wouldn't be so scandalous mm -hmm. right now, or wouldn't even be scandalous at all. They were scandalous at the time, especially to extreme right wing conservative groups, religious type groups, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I mean, movies were seriously under the gun. They were in fear that they were not going to be able to be shown anymore. And um, so Fatty comes back after this. Roscoe comes back after this. Uh, this, I don't even know how to word it. Debacle. Uh, this debacle. <laughs> And um, he's like, okay, I'm ready back. I'm ready to work again. And um, they basically say, no, thank you. You're your story isn't worth the risk, right? Yeah, you're, you're banned from appearing in front of the camera. And it was an official ban um, enacted by... Like the original blacklist. Yeah, it was, it was essentially a blacklist. He wasn't going to be able to appear at all in films. Um, and his, his, his out, he had to shift gears. So basically, mm -hmm. his outlet turned to be uh, directing under a pseudonym. He used his dad's name, William Goodrich, as a pseudonym. And uh, he, so he did that uh, as well as uh, um, appearing on stage and doing personal appearances and tours because he still had a fan base. Um, so he actually uh, did all right. You know, once he finally recouped the costs of going on trial three times um, and uh, owned a nightclub in the late 20s for a time. Uh, and uh, so this band lasted essentially, a, you know, just over a decade and, um, From William Hayes? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I've read that that ban was lifted within a year, but he oh. never worked in front of the camera for like a decade, and it was probably more just an unofficial blacklist type right. situation. Um, so in the early... The studios were so profitable at this time, and there was such a fear that anything could ruin that profit that it wasn't worth the risk. Yeah. Why, why put Arbuckle up when we have other comics, other performers that are lower risk or less notoriously known, mm -hmm. um, we might as well not risk it. Um, so, so he's directing films under the pseudonym and, and in the early thirties, he, uh, finally gets the opportunity to act in front of the camera again. Um, 
signs with Warner Brothers to make six two reel shorts, uh, sound shorts, and um, so he makes them uh, in in Brooklyn, uh, films them there, and uh, they're they're good, they're they're pretty good, and they're well received. You know, um, they do well, and uh, he had he had just gotten married again. Uh, you know, had his uh, uh, new wife, and they. Uh, celebrated the success of these six shorts, um, signed a contract to do a feature film. Uh, Warner Brothers said, these went well, let's do a feature. Um, signed a contract that day, happened to be his one-year wedding anniversary too, on cloud nine, I assume. you know. And that night he goes to bed and dies in his sleep of a heart attack. You know? This is true. The, uh, yeah. the, the fact that he signed the contract that day and died that night, that is a true story? That's absolutely true, yep. It's devastating. <laughs> uh, you know, he, you know, it's kind of, it, it's a, it's a terrible thing to have happen, mm -hmm. but I, it, at least his last day was a great day. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, he's 46, obviously it would have been better that he stuck around, but yeah, at least that last day was a good day. So because of all of that, because of that whole bad story we just told you, mm -hmm. The whole point of this Fatty Arbuckle and Friends show that we want to put on for you at the Senate Theater, again, January 18th, um, is to highlight before this happened and, and highlight the artistry that he did complete and that he, the work that he did do and that everyone loved at the time, obviously overshadowed eventually later on and still today people are confused about the story. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we've had this... Uh, this event on Facebook for a while and on our website and whatnot, and we're our, and I've been getting a little bit of back. I handle the social media, so I've been getting a, a little bit of backlash some, from some fans, saying, uh, you know, oh, well, he did this terrible thing. Why are you showing this? Right. Type type thing. But the, that's exactly the whole point of this series is to shed light, right? Yes. Absolutely. So, tell us a little bit more exactly what's going on on January 18th. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the six shorts we're showing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're showing, uh, uh, it's basically two parts. Um, the first uh, the first half of the show, we're showing four shorts. Um, we're showing uh, A Thief Catcher, which is a five minute short, uh, 1913. We, like I say, we're going chronologically. Uh, then we have one with Charlie Chaplin called The Rounders with Arbuckle and Chaplin. Which I watched today, which is a bunch of drunk buffoons. Yeah, <laughs> drunk buffoonery. <laughs> Stole. Yeah. <laughs> they, st they steal money from their wives and then go to the bar to sleep. <laughs> yeah, as, as, you, as you'll do. Yeah. Um, and then uh, after that, we've got... Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing one. I'm trying to think. Uh, Peeping Pete's. Peeping Pete, The Rounders. Oh, Waiter's Ball. Waiter's Ball. Yeah, Waiter's Ball, which is a... I don't know how I forgot it because it's one of my all-time favorite, you know, Arbuckle movies. Um, the, there's just like endless gags. Uh, he's in the, he's the chef at a, at a restaurant and just has all these bits of business. He's, you know, flipping pancakes with his feet. He's got a live fish that he's trying to, like, cook, oh, yeah. you know. Oh, this is a I, great one, actually, because <laughs> I, I watched this one, too. It's great because he... Uh, it's basically a front-of-house, back-of-house uh, fight yeah. And, and Roscoe's the chef, and then there's a waiter. I don't know who plays the waiter. Yeah, but, Al St. Uh, John, who's actually his nephew in real life. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they have this whole uh, front house, back of house fight that ends in them just spanking each other with brooms mm -hmm. repeatedly <laughs> over and over. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a great gag. You should see, you'll have to see that one. Um, and then we're showing Fatty and Mabel Adrift, which I mentioned, um, uh, with Mabel Normand as the co star, another comedic actress that I love. Uh, stay tuned someday for uh, some more Mabel Norman content at the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the intermission's over, um, I'm going to uh, just have a brief Q&A with Paul Garucki. Um, you know, we'll answer any questions they might have had for the, from the first series of shorts and maybe some Arbuckle questions, because obviously there will be some. And then uh, we'll move into the second half, which is two longer shorts. Uh, the... Uh, Coney Island, which is um, Arbuckle and, and uh, Keaton. That's after he moved to Paramount. That's just gag after gag of them on the beach and, and in the Coney Island uh, park. Uh, are, all those, carnival. are all the first ones Keystone? Yes. Okay. Yep. And then the last one is a short called Love from 1919, which is uh, also Paramount. And that one is... Um, that one uh, I need to get more details on, but I know it was lost for 
decades, many decades. And Paul Garucki was the first one to put together a oh, really? basically a you know uh, usable or viewable copy of it. And so, but that's the film program, or that's the the list of movies we're showing. And at the end, nor, as as we normally do during our silent series, we'll have um, a little Q and A with the organist, mm -hmm. and that's always very interesting. Andrew Rogers gives a, a great presentation um, of uh, you know how he came to. Uh, develop his accompaniment um, because basically I've handed him these movies and he's now as we speak you know working at home mm -hmm. coming up with just a score all on his own all on his own yeah. which is another thing I should mention because it's it's something that didn't even dawn on me until a few silent films in that we had been showing last year well mm -hmm. you know after we I had started and you know, I, I, I was watching these silent films originally thinking that whoever was on the organ was playing what was written for the film at mm -hmm. the time. But that's not the case. Uh, oftentimes these scores are missing and they're not findable. They're lost. Mm -hmm. And so our organists literally spend time creating their own score to this film, which is so it's a completely unique experience that you can have. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're you're going to see. You're gonna see films with accompaniment that you won't hear again. You won't hear again. You'll be well, hopefully we'll record it. We'll, yeah, we're working on that. But uh, you know, you get the DVD set. It's a different score. Mm -hmm. And uh, but and you're also seeing these movies as they originally were presented with that live organ. Um, you know, there are ways that people accompany films today. I won't get too much on my high horse, <laughs> but you know, there's a, there's a, a trend these days. Uh, when you're seeing something live, a film live, a silent movie, or you're getting more recent Blu-ray releases that they have a more, they've, they've commissioned modern musicians or musicians that do a modern score. Mm -hmm. And it uh, doesn't work. No. It just doesn't fit. And it's, uh, it's not the, the Luddite in me. It's just the fact that the, the score is supposed to accompany the film. And uh, I remember talking to organist Ben Modell, who's a, uh, kind of a leader in the, the field and he basically said if you you know people come up to me and they say I, I, I kind of forgot you were there and he's like that's the biggest compliment I can get mm -hmm. it's supposed to enhance the film but it's not supposed to be intrusive or right. you know, over the top um, it's supposed to be completely complimentary yeah yep it's an immersive experience and that's just part of the experience of enjoying the movie mm -hmm. and improper accompaniment can really affect your enjoyment of the movie Absolutely. but we won't get that with andrew rogers he's oh no he's solid. fantastic <laughs> andrew rogers is fantastic we've had him last year and mm -hmm. he put on a wonderful performance and a great q a afterwards so if you mm -hmm. come and you have questions and you will have questions because i have lots of questions usually <laughs> he answers them mm -hmm. wonderfully yeah. um oh and i to interrupt we'll also have the chamber tour oh yes yeah and so, from what I'm told, and I don't know if this is true or not, but we are apparently the only theater in the world that has a theater organ tour. Oh, that's news to me. Huh. Uh, you know, I, I'm saying this, but uh, this is what they told me at the theater. This is the only okay. theater in the world that you can go through the chambers of the organ. And when I'm saying, when I say this, you know, so on the stage there is the council, right? There's the keys and the council of the organ that you see the person playing, the organist playing. But all of the instruments lay behind the screen in four, five rooms? Yeah, four rooms and then like a, a, a room for relays and switches. And yes, yeah. and like, and once you realize that this whole thing is the, is the instrument and you get to walk through this after the show, your mind will be blown. I, I can't express how shocking it is to, to realize that this whole stage is filled with an instrument yeah right yeah is that how you felt when you saw it yeah essentially in the in the theater itself the auditorium is like a speaker box mm -hmm. um you're kind of almost part of the instrument mm -hmm. um yeah it's immersive i mean the pipes back there are they go to the sky. There's no microphones or anything no. that oh. micing the instrument. It is a completely just the instrument blowing air, mm -hmm. blasting you. Yep, it's all pneumatic. Uh, you know, they control the volume by opening and closing louvers up uh, on the backstage there, uh, with their feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, yeah, it's all all manual. And yeah, and, and we when we walk people back there, it's 
it really blows their mind. It's really nice to see their faces, actually. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a real treat. <laughs> so another thing that we have, um, Cinema Museum is sponsoring this event. They've provided us provided us with the films, mm -hmm. and um, they're also bringing some memorabilia. Oh, of course. I don't know how I. <laughs> it's the best, maybe the best for last. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like I said, uh, uh, you know, Cinema Museum is is uh, working with us and is graciously. Uh, uh, agreed to bring memorabilia uh, of Roscoe Arbuckle, uh, including personal possessions. So uh, there'll be uh, a makeup kit that Roscoe used to use, you know, for his um, stage appearances. There's uh, uh, one of his bowler hats, you know, the things that That's awesome. he tangibly owned. Uh, I'm going to bring in, you know, some original stills that he, you know, that, that were distributed by his nightclub and, uh, you know, lobby cards and stuff like that. Um, so there'll be some great things to see uh, to really kind of you know connect you to mm -hmm. the to the artist to oh, Roscoe Arbuckle. It's going to be a great night. Yeah, it should be. Should be All great. right. Uh, to summarize, Silence at the Senate is our series of silent films at the Senate Theater. Our first of the year in 2020 is Fatty Arbuckle and Friends. Mm -hmm. Organist is Andrew Rogers. That is on January 18th, Saturday, at 8 p.m. Doors are at 7 p.m. Tickets are ten dollars. Um, sponsored by Cinema Museum. Night Foundation and Culture Source. Yes, we hope to see you there. Yes, and kids twelve and under are free. Oh, Let's absolutely! Oh, that's right. <laughs> kids twelve and under are free. So please bring your kids. Yes, please, please bring your kids. Um, as a booster of you know silent cinema in general, and a, 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 a strong advocate for uh, Roscoe Arbuckle, mm -hmm. I, I I hope you'll come, and I really hope you'll bring your kids. Silent. Shorts are just the perfect thing for kids to watch and enjoy. Uh, there's not going to be a ton of talk about the unpleasantness. Uh, it'll right. be it'll be kid friendly, mm -hmm. and uh, and kids love slapstick. I can. Kid, yeah, you uh, yeah. I have a kid one, right yes. now, and every time I hurt myself, <laughs> he laughs. Ah. <laughs> yeah, they're car they're live action cartoons. Mm -hmm. These movies, and uh, they don't require a lot of uh, dialogue. You know, that, so it's kind of perfect for the real little ones too. Absolutely. You know, get used to. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for checking us out, guys. Uh, showtime at the Senate. We'll check you back next week uh, for our next show. Thanks. <laughs>